You're listening to The Streaming Wars, the podcast that discusses all of the latest happenings regarding your favorite streaming services. Find out which service is winning the war this time around. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the latest episode of The Streaming Wars. This time around, we're doing a little bit different. While Tony is joining me, we're going to be talking about a couple of, specifically a topic that has popped up over the past week. Um, One that uh, if you listen to last week's episode um, on Tuesday that we released, or on Wednesday when you heard it, if you listen to that episode, we talked about how we're going to talk about a John Stinky interview. Well, it turns out there was another interview that happened as part of the same event that we also want to talk about, an interview with Kevin Meyer from Disney+. Plus. He's an executive, the kind of the, 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 the face of the executives behind Disney Plus as a service. So there was. So we're going to talk about those two interviews. We're not talking about news this time around, and obviously we pre-recorded this to release while we are actually taking the week off because we we want to discuss this at a at a higher level than what we have been uh, having time for. So so basically, to to give you a little bit of backstory behind what this event was, there is if you're familiar with the website Vox or if you've ever heard of Vox Media. They have a subsection of their site called Recode. And on their actual site, it talks about how this section of their website talks about digital aspects and how they're changing the world and us. And they had an event where they had pretty much big name people from the world of tech and the digital side of things to discuss what their companies are doing for you know what 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 their companies are doing digitally to change the world around us and us so there was a number of different ones there was you know facebook had someone there talking about stuff they had people from other companies but the ones that are worth mentioning for us specifically here is that they had the ceo of uh, warner media john stanky uh, there and he was asked a number of questions a lot of the questions dealt with what actually was talked about at uh for the HBO Max uh, announcement that was just a couple weeks back. The the entire gist of the conversation was all about HBO Max and what they're expecting and what they're doing and kind of clarifying some of the things that were potentially unclear at the uh, at the point of the announcement a couple weeks back. The other one was Kevin Meyer, who, like I said, is behind Disney+. Plus, and... While their aspect is way, their entire, the conversation about Disney Plus is completely different. They're not talking about what is coming. They're talking about, well, it just launched. So what can we, you know, what, what do we talk, let's talk about how the launch went, what we're expecting, what, what to expect in the future for the service, what changes have you, or what, what issues has, has arisen from the launch, things like that. So completely two different ends of the spectrum because one is already out, one is not, and kind of getting these executives perspective of their respective, respected services. So we're going to start with the John Stinky one because that one was the that was the first interview that had popped up but there was there was a lot of the the big headline that came out of the John Stinky interview was not so much that they're looking to replace Netflix but that they are looking to become the next cable bundle meaning they had already talked about this at the HBO Max investor event that they had a couple weeks back about how they had every intention of trying to pair HBO Now with their current AT&T TV Now. We talked about AT&T TV Now and some of the other live streaming uh, television services uh, just last week, but the intent is that AT&T TV Now is a replacement for cable television, which as we know, AT&T and DirecTV, which is all part of this, or AT&T Universe and DirecTV, those are services that uh, continue to lose subscribers at in a, a very fast rate. So they're really going to be trying to push this new bundle. Conveniently, it's also interesting because AT&T TV Now just raised their prices to $64.99, I believe this interview took place before the price increase went into effect, so there wasn't really any discussion about that. But it became almost one of the it really became one of the most expensive live streaming TV services that are available. And while there's talk about the other services out there also raising their prices, we know Hulu is raising their price next month. It begs the question of how are they really going to push this service if it's one of the more expensive ones and their intent is to use it as a replacement for cable services 
as a company if the intent was to also bundle it with HBO Max. So my my question I want to leave with you because I know when you watched the interview, what do you think? I mean, like it definitely feels like HBO Max is an add-on service to AT&T TV now and that's what they're intending on doing and they'll intend on, you know, offering other add-on services to AT&T TV now, but it feels like they're basically creating what I would like to classify as the a, a very Hulu based system they're already got the live tv but if they start having these other services that you can tack onto it like hbo max and that's a huge focus it gives you a reason to subscribe to them rather than hulu which is obviously a direct competitor when it comes to disney and warner brothers so where do you where do you see this going because it doesn't feel especially based off of this interview it doesn't feel like their focus is rolling out a streaming service like netflix which we've talked about before uh, privately and on the podcast about how it definitely feels like their international rollout is not a priority, which everyone would expect it to be based off of what we've seen from the growth for Netflix, the growth that Disney plans to have with rolling their stuff out very, very quickly in the near future for Disney Plus. It feels to me, at least, that the the brand as a whole could be potentially diluted in order to push this streaming TV service. At least that's what I got out of the interview. So what did you get? My take on it is, I it was very interesting. You know, at, at the time that this releases, you know, Disney Plus would probably be um, about one to two weeks out in terms of you know being a mature service. And Apple TV has been out since the beginning of the month, uh, so about like three weeks by now. And, and so taking those two services, those are very much in terms of modeling after you know Amazon in in Disney. I'm um, sorry, and Netflix per se in terms of the model. HBO seems like it's playing a weird game. I kind of do agree with you in the fact of it's. Kind Kind of looking more to just being a bundle per se, um, a conglomeration, a conglomeration of, of different things. But it, but it also it's it's hard to categorize what HBO Max is trying to be because it's still part of the AT&T uh, portfolio. And AT&T has its cable service. So you have AT&T Now, um, you have HBO, you have HBO Go, you have all these different banners that we keep repeating over and over again. And, and it's just been hard for me to distill, okay, what is Warner our media's vision for all this different stuff? I think the Hulu model is pretty interesting. And so and if, if people don't know Hulu has its base stuff, but then it also has the ability to plug in and essentially add in different channels, quote unquote channels to these other services like stars and hbo and stuff like that i think that's the most creative approach to go because what's really more important is it's the platform right it's not the content per se right netflix is the content in the platform or essentially synonymous synonymous right they're they're the one in the same disney plus the same thing hulu is a little bit different because it it is creator but it also has the ability to leverage other partners into its fold that's what hbo max is trying to be, in my opinion, is to to be so flexible. You can get the live TV if you want it, but if you don't, that's fine. If you want HBO Max stuff, that's fine. That's great. If you want to get another partner channel into it, like that's great. Um, that, that to me seems like what HBO Max is trying to be, and it kind of honestly makes a little bit more sense for what HBO, uh, sorry for what um, AT and T and Warner Media are trying to do. There's been some questions of why you know Warner Media doesn't bring back some of its shows that it's been licensed out to, because as we've talked about in multiple episodes, that Warner likes to license out their content for other t- studios um, for either TV television project projects or movie projects right so they're not like bringing all that stuff inside in in house they're letting other studios do their things and they're gonna do theirs as well and do licensing agreements and make money that way and that kind of is reflected into its business model what HBO Max is trying to do as well is is to basically all right here's our stuff then from there you can add on you can leverage different parts and put stuff that you want together and there you go it's different I don't think it's a bad strategy I think it could work it's just unfortunately it's just a bunch of moving parts of trying to get stuff done because not only do you have to organize with outside partners it's like you know at&t and warner media i'm like they still have to like coordinate with them themselves and unfortunately at&t's like media strategy is still a little bit scattered per se in my opinion it's just like okay like we want to go down this direction we want to essentially replace the subscribers that we lost for like direct tv and cable subscriptions we want to replace that revenue with something else and they're like hey let's go into streaming and that's fine but it seems like it it, things are still a bit uh, a little lost and it fragmented so I, I get what hbo is trying to do i do agree with you in terms of it, the p- plug-in system partner system hbo is still a little bit in my opinion further away from the goal of where they want to be and what they want to do but i think it's a 
It's definitely different. Not bad different, just different. The thing for me is, you know, the the quote that stood out from this interview, which will have the interview from for for this will have this interview in the show notes. The thing that stood out to me is that he said we are currently the uh, consumers are in the process of rebundling. They're not you know, they're not getting telephone, internet, and cable. They're maybe just getting internet and, you know, they're basically cutting the cable cord. And then there's people who are not, you know, they, they, they're just going wireless and they're just using their wireless carrier. And obviously AT&T has the advantage of being not only a wireless carrier, but also a carrier for in-home cable, telephone, and uh, internet for a good majority of the country. And or at least a possibility of, of a provider for a lot of the homes in America. And I think, to me, while consumers are unbundling, his re- reference was, well, people are going to start rebundling things. They're going to start doing And I don't disagree. We've talked about this before, about how, you know, if you added up Disney Plus and you add HBO Max and you add Hulu and you add Apple TV Plus, you add all these together, you know, you're still creating your own personal bundle based off the content that you want to see. There's nothing necessarily wrong with that, but it can be frustrating in the sense of, you know, you have to go to all these different services to try to find something. And they, he, HBO Max has, has gone on about how, you know, they're, they're going to be doing a lot of human content curation, which I don't, I mean, like, it'll definitely be better than the algorithms that Netflix has used. While they've gotten better over the years, there's been issues I mean, that with. Sounds sexy, but that's right. It's not. It's not, not like it's it, to me. There's no advantage to that. There's like it's a it's such a small advantage that it means nothing. I personally do not want somebody else telling me what to watch. I don't want to, you know, in the investor meeting, they showed a clip where you could click on a celebrity and the celebrity would suggest something for you to watch. That's not something that I'm going to use. And I imagine the majority of the current HBO subscriber base, which is, is, is skewed older rather than younger, is not going to use a feature like that. So to me... It's not a feature that's really going to sell them, but they keep talking about it. And it's like they're trying to aim that specific aspect towards a younger audience, which is fine. But I just, I mean, like, obviously there are plenty of people that they are convinced to watch something because somebody else says to watch and that tends to be the younger generations. The problem is that that can't be the only focus in the differential between this service and somewhere else. I've been watching some discussions and listening to some podcasts about how the idea of HBO Max in some ways, and I think we said this even ourselves back on the current state of HBO Max, they're slightly diluting what HBO has by having this other content. While they will say we are not in the we're not trying to do anything different than what HBO has always done. We're just trying to create more content at the same quality level that you've always gotten. That's why they're warranting that's why they claim that the price is warranted is because you're still going to be getting this quality content. The problem is that by having this other content that falls in line with other genres and things like that, that typically does not scream quality, you're going to have some problems. I mean, there's a couple different reality shows that have been announced. While docu-series HBO is already doing, and HBO already produces comedies and dramas and a variety of other content, some of the content that they're, they're, they're creating, if it's not on par with what HBO is currently doing, there's going to be some major, major problems with it just diluting the brand that is HBO, which could ultimately hurt them in the larger scheme of things. Because if HBO Max really doesn't take off, then you could run into the problem of the you know it hurting the brand that is just HBO and subscribers being like, well, the brand doesn't, the brand, the singular brand of HBO isn't what it used to be because this other content is out there that's also associated with the name. And I don't necessarily want that to happen because like I've said before, I watch a lot of content on HBO and I appreciate a lot of the content on HBO. It just comes down to is what they're doing beneficial? If, you know, we talked about the name 
And I said, I'm not sure why they chose to go with HBO, except for the fact that that name demands quality. That's what it's always been. But if it does, if it strays from that quality, because the intent is just to create extra content that people are going to be interested in, I don't know that that's going to be beneficial. All right. So then the other interview was an interview with Kevin Meyer, the executive who's kind of the front man for H- or Disney Plus. This was, like I said, a completely different area of discussion because they've already launched. But one of the things that came up in the the conversation was that they specifically asked, like, well, what happened on day one? Why was there issues? And there's been a lot of conspiracies that other companies, Amazon Web Services, um, which deals with Disney Plus and or supports Disney Plus, I should say, like there was rumors that maybe Amazon was trying to mess with Disney so that it's not successful because they already have Prime Video. And that can be further from the truth. Basically, Disney came out to say, listen, the app that we created, the architecture behind it wasn't exactly great. And we learned that the hard way by having a lot of issues. He said that they're already in the process of trying to work a lot of that out and that they're planning on having a massive update for the service within the next two weeks. And when that happens, it should resolve a lot of the problems that people have been having. I I'm, you know, I applaud them for you know going to the lengths of trying to get that update out as soon as possible. Obviously, apps in general are always going to have bugs and they always got to get worked out. They attempted to have a lot of that stuff worked out by having the beta launch that they had in the Netherlands. They probably just didn't have the amount of traffic that they, or, well, they probably had the amount of traffic that they anticipated, but didn't actually, because the, the traffic was so much higher than what they predicted, then there was, you know, there was issues. So there was that. The other, only other thing to pull out of the interview that I thought was interesting was they specifically said that, you know, Disney is a company that doesn't really, they don't have, so uh, to back up a little bit, so Netflix, a lot of what they produce is based off of what people absorb, what they watch, how much and how often they watch the content that they watch. There's a reason why Adam Sandler has so many movies available on Netflix, and it's because people will watch that content on Netflix. That's why they keep producing this stuff. It's why certain series get canceled before they feel like, sometimes before you feel like they were ever given a chance, is because people just are not watching it. And part of that has to do with the fact that maybe it wasn't marketed well, but part of it has to do with maybe it's just not something that audiences are connecting with. But they have a lot of data that they use to judge what they actually should make. HBO Max, they've been talking about, and one of the things that we're talking about over and over again in the investor meeting is that AT&T owns a company called Xander, which is a data is a data company. They basically, it's a a personal data company that that mines their services to get information to sell anonymously like it's not data personally for you an individual like <clears throat> Facebook sometimes is accused of but content that is or uh, data that is specifically anonymized to give it to advertisers and say this is the type of people who are watching the show this is the type of, they have this company and they were talking about how HBO Max when it launches it will be working hand in hand with Xander to create data so that they can go find other content to get other production companies to create, you know, to continue to create content that people are actually enjoying and and appreciating. Disney, however, doesn't have that. They don't have a data company. And specifically when asked about how they're going to use their data from just the usage rates of Disney Plus, they were asked, how are you going to, you know, what are you going to do with that data as far as how you create content? And they specifically said, we have absolutely no, we, we probably will not be following the data as much as you would think we are disney and because we are disney we sometimes believe a program can be successful regardless of what the data says Um, they did however say that they are going to be creating more adult content which goes hand in hand with the complaint that we had uh last week in our episode where we talked about how it just doesn't feel like there's a ton of content that's more adult oriented or just meant for adults not just family and children content so they did say that they're going to do that i don't know what that means because let's be honest the entire service is a very family friendly service so the content that they create is still going to be in some way acceptable for children to read or to to you know to watch but just be able to also appeal more towards adults i'm thinking on the lines of like the simpsons or something like that where they create content that is you know more focused on the adult audience but can still be watched by 
children without it being, you know, too raunchy or too adult oriented. But it's interesting because they basically said, we've been, we're, we're Disney, we've been doing this for as long as we have. We're creating shows based on what we believe will be successful. And the only thing that I have to, the only comment I have in regards to that is, Disney, outside of their recent success with the Marvel films, the Star Wars films, their live action remakes, and some of just slight other things, they have not had exactly the best track record when it comes to creating content or acknowledging what's really successful. They have created TV shows for the variety of Disney channels or ABC has created shows that don't tend to take off very well. There's a lot of shows that don't make it past one or two seasons or they cancel it and there is a fan base, but it's just, I guess, not enough for them to keep doing it. But then there's other aspects where like, if you look at their box office, their, their movies that they've released through theater, theatrical releases over the past 10 years, they've had their fair share of flops. A lot of the, the ones that are super successful fall within one of those categories I already mentioned, but the flops tend to be stuff that's outside of that. You look at a movie like Wrinkle in Time, which released last year, the movie didn't do very well at all. They assumed it would, and they went about making the movie and, and marketed it very well. They didn't do a bad job of marketing or anything like that, but it didn't end up doing very well in the box office. And, and you have to kind of wonder, obviously... They have become a very, very much IP-driven company as far as what they create. A lot of the focus on the content that's coming to Disney Plus is IP-driven. So you have to wonder to yourself, is this idea that Disney knows exactly what their customers want, is this completely true or is there, is there some fallacy in the idea of what they believe is quality content or content that uh, people actually enjoy yeah i actually have a couple thoughts on this whole entire disney interview i guess i'll start with the last first about this using data and disney's you know explanation of we know we, we kind of know what's going on this reminds me um i'm a big sports guy in about the last decade there's been a big push to use like analytics and sports the the most i guess uh, popular example of this is uh, the movie moneyball has brad pitt in it anyway he uses statistics to help this guy use stats to essentially help with this baseball team in and for me i'm kind of getting those vibes right now between uh, of sports and using should we use analytics to, to to drive the team or should we not um in basketball the biggest one that does this is um the houston rockets analytically it says that you know you should take more three-point shots and that's going to be better overall for your game plan threes and layups which is fine if you can hit threes you know sometimes it's hard to shoot a ball 20 something feet away in a tiny hole and and that's fine but if you look at it they've always had issues getting far into the the nba playoffs and stuff like that they've always had breakdowns and stuff um weird issues the point i'm trying to say is it's we're in the age and right i, I work in this business of of using data using data to make decisions in the software world it's called data driven development you know you're using data to drive your business. But it's one, hard to collect all this data and then you have to hire people to actually do something with it. And when, when you've been a traditional company, when I say traditional in the sense of terms of Hollywood, so Netflix, I would say, is a very untraditional company. Um, they came on the scene and when they made the content, they don't release until like recently. Didn't release really their stuff at theaters. It was all, you know, per devices and how do we get people to watch on devices not really like hey let's focus on like winning awards and stuff like that but disney is is very much from that old era of movie and tv development and with that it's probably still got some hangover of you know older ideas of hey like we we have this whole content team and we can survey and we can pick what the users are going to want which is fine but you know in the advent advent having more data than we know what to do with it's probably not the best thing to to do right now you know if you have the information you should use it however i don't think companies should be so you know solely devoted to data but that's a slightly different discussion so hearing that disney's take is like you know hey we're not gonna they're gonna use some data but it's like hey we're not gonna be a data it seems like i'm not gonna put words in their mouth it seems like hey we're not gonna be a data driven company we're still gonna rely on our instincts and our um, acumen to really usher and push disney into the future well that's, that's a bad idea because the streaming, how people watch streaming content is different from the traditional content. And so like, although some of those same rules do apply from the traditional old school way to the new streaming way, there's a lot of you know similarities. There's also a bunch of dissimilarities in the people and the audience and how, what time of night do people really watch this stuff? You know, what do people want to watch? And that's very important. And hearing that Disney is, is seemingly 
like it's not going to take that you know too serious it is, is a little dis- disheartening because you know when 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 you're a new player like you need all the help that you can get and hearing disney say like hey we're gonna not even collect the data we're not even gonna make we're not have a team we're not gonna even entertain these ideas that's a little scary because it's like hey like at the end of the day you, you might have to agree with their recommendation but it's better to have that data just in case it's better to have that opinion than not have that opinion at all and so hearing disney's take on this is a little it's, it's just disconcerting because it's like all right like that just seems you're trusting in yourself a little bit too much, even though you're a newcomer in the space and there's other people who've done it for a very long time, who've been very successful by being a data-driven company. Yeah. So do you have any thoughts on that before I like I, I go tackle on a, on a different thing about Disney? No, I mean, like, I, I agree. I mean, the data a lot of times will point you in the direction you need to go. But I also feel like the stuff that's super successful at Disney is just going to point to more Marvel stuff, more Star Wars stuff, more live action remakes, and that could be problematic too for just creating different and unique content. We've talked about this before, about how original content or original ideas is something that doesn't really just seem to be that big of a focus, especially currently at Disney. That's not to say it's always been like that, but a lot of what Disney produces is based off of other things. All their animated classics are based off of books or old fairy tales. The Now we're currently seeing this wave of live action remakes of their of the same exact films. We're seeing, you know, Marvel and Star Wars stuff and obviously Star Wars films are it was an original thought, but now everything they're creating is diving from the or going back to the original well of what the Star Wars franchise was prior to them owning it. Marvel derives a lot of their stuff from the comics. So like I want to see original content. That's not to say you can't have something that's, you know, based off of a book or a comic book or anything like that or an existing, you know, media that existed prior to them obtaining it and, you know, before they purchased the IP, but it really does come down to like they're not really creating a whole lot of original ideas and that's the that's the biggest problem. Like if that's how they're content and they're content with making content like that, then that's just who they will be. But if they don't create some sort of original content and i'm really hoping that maybe them being involved with the fox side of things will see maybe aspects still happen i'm worried of course that because 20th century 21st century fox was was you know merged into disney i'm I'm concerned that companies like fox searchlight that produce a lot of original ideas or really quality movies might not be releasing as much because disney already has a very very robust release schedule theatrically um, we're also you also have 21st Century Fox, which can release other things, but it'll be interesting to see how much they actually are allowed to release. They just shifted up a lot of the release schedule for the past year. A show there was a movie, The Kingsman, a prequel to the Kingsman series, was supposed to come out in February. They just had a huge marketing push at New York Comic Con back in October, and they just shifted the movie release date from February all the way to September of next year. So I wonder if that stuff is going to take a backseat to the other stuff that they already know is super popular and super is going to gain them a lot more money, which is great. But then you hear on the other side of it, and not specifically HBO Max, but Warner Brothers as a company has always been very creative driven. And the people behind the camera are the ones who are driving these projects and they tend to give the creators a little bit more uh, support with their ideas. It's one of the reasons why we have uh, directors like Clint Eastwood who keeps producing content for the same studio over and over again. There's other directors who they just keep putting movies out through the same company because they've they've got these relationships and you don't really see that at Disney uh, and, the per- and, and the most obvious a- evidence of that is you look at a a guy like J.J. Abrams, who was basically the guy who, you know, ushered in the new version of Star Wars, ended up coming back to do another Star Wars film, but then took his entire production company elsewhere because he was looking for more creative freedom. And that's not something you typically hear about when you're at Disney. That's all I have to say about that. Yeah. Well, J.J., when he took up the Star Wars, he already had a contract with paramount so he was already that's true he's he was in a weird case to begin with which surprised didn't get sued at the point so going back to the the tech things about disney this whole rumor that amazon was trying to sink disney is the stupidest thing ever and let me tell you why first off yes prime makes a lot of money but we don't know is how many people get prime to watch prime video I think that a lot of people have Prime for like shipping, and I think a lot of people with that Prime membership watch Prime Video. I don't, I don't know the numbers on how many people get Prime just for Prime Video. You know what I mean? But whatever that number is, it's going to be less than what AWS makes 
a year. Amazon Web Services is could be its own huge business, very successful business that frankly, if we're a spinoff business, cut off the baggage of Amazon proper, I would probably invest in them. Just that they power like one third of the internet. They're very huge. And so it's actually in Amazon's best interest for Disney to succeed, Disney to wildly, wildly succeed. And here's why. Every, and this is going to, this whole process of how we watch videos, um, I'm going to detail that in a future episode, but the more that people use Disney Plus, signs up for it, and streams content, the more that to spin them up or to use them and bandwidth and stuff like that, like running a streaming service is very expensive. Cloud, cloud computing is expensive. It can get very expensive very quickly. Because you're charging things like per second of bandwidth, um, per second of compute time and storage, you know, by the gigabytes or the terabytes, like that stuff adds up very quickly. If there's going to be downtime, right, in Disney Plus service, that means that Disney is not going to really be using Amazon service at the moment because of just random screw ups. And Amazon's not going to make that money. And so for Amazon, it doesn't matter that Disney is a competitor because at the end of the day, they still win. And if more people use Disney Plus that means the more service that they're they're going to have to rent from Amazon. And that means that Amazon's going to get a fatter check from Disney. And so it doesn't make sense, this whole idea of sabotage, because frankly, if they sabotage Disney Plus, it's going to really sabotage themselves. And that's dumb. The whole conspiracy theory is just stupid. Man, I hate conspiracy theories sometimes. It just doesn't make sense. Like, it's in Amazon's best interest to help Disney in, in this tech space. So it was nice to hear the Disney executive basically <laughs> agree with my, my assessment on the service of, of how that they were not prepared. Like, because Disney personally people like their their app was not prepared for for the for the volume and i kind of called that just by um my analysis of what i was seeing in the app and experience some of the bugs and the things that are here and like it's hard to to gauge how how popular something be how many people are going to use it like yeah, you could test something locally on your machine and it works but testing okay what happens when you get 10 million people use it at the same time it's very hard to simulate if you could simulate it at all and so i was lenient with the bugs because i realized like okay like yeah this this, this stuff's hard, especially if you're not if you're not used to it. It's actually interesting when you when you hear that statement by the Disney executive, of like, "Hey, we messed up in our in our you know software development of of making this thing to scale." It just reminded me. I think it was in the Stinky interview. He talked about how um, Warner Brothers or HBO they've been doing this for years with Game of Thrones. Like, you know, because Game of Thrones, especially in later seasons, like you know, every Sunday night, goodness sakes, how many people would have like tuned in on to Warner Brothers stars to watch the Game of Thrones episode, and so they've gotten actually good at simulating okay um simultaneous connections concurrent downloads concurrent streams and stuff like that like they've kind of at least had their foot into this idea of scale and they have consultants and stuff to actually like help them in the space like they're used to it i don't know if we talked about this but we saw an article i think either you or i shared an article um, about how warner brothers used to have bam tech as their backing of the streaming service um, which powers Disney right now. And they ditched that for their own service, their own backend, sorry. And they learned the hard way of how to scale HBO and how to scale Game of Thrones and all that stuff. And so it's just it it's just the the parity between, you know, HBO and then Disney and their struggles and their tech struggles and stuff like that. And it just kind of makes me laugh because it's like, man, I called it. Like, I mean, I hate to be hate to to flaunt, you know, chip on my shoulder, but it's like, yeah, that totally makes sense of everything and how Disney just didn't plan correctly. And it's hard. And I don't think people should give Disney crap about it because like if you don't understand how complicated something is going to be like it it's it's hard to plan in mass and scale you know it's easy for like one person okay like all right here's this going to be and we're use this and blah 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 but when you're scaling up to millions and millions of concurrent connections that's it's hard to figure out and so yeah o- overall like it was pretty great that that the disney executive just basically admitted like hey like we we underestimated we screwed up that was that was pretty good on his part because i feel like the more honest you're going to be with customers they're going to understand like okay like hey like all right disney doesn't really know what they're doing here this is the first take like okay we can be we can we can show them grace you know versus like you know it's not our fault blah 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 like i think people respect humility i think people respect when you apologize of a feeling i think customers recognize that and i don't think that yeah i think that disney's going to lose a lot of, of of subscribers over these these tech mishaps during its first week or month i think if they're going to lose subscribers it's going to be over like content-based issues not tech issues because consumers are more forgiving than i think some people let on it's nice to see a company taking acknowledging that there is there's issues because the the biggest thing is when a company doesn't acknowledge that there's issues or that you know it shows why it happened or says why it happened you tend to have people get upset just because they're not no because they don't know they don't understand or you have these situations where you they start pointing the blame at certain certain places and of course the diehard disney fans are going to be like well it can't be disney's fault because it's disney we love disney 
it's got to be somebody else. So they'll look to figure out who they can point the finger at. That's such a cognitive bias, though. Like, that's a major cognitive bias right there that limits people. It's like, well, I believe this can't happen, so it's not going to happen. Yeah. Well, it's just dumb. Yeah, like, it is. So and, I, I but, just, but the reality of it is that stuff like that happens all the time. And it's it happens in every aspect yeah. of, of uh, anything that the news covers. Let's just put it that way. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's nice to see that they took – they acknowledged the fact that there was issues. They're working on it. It's also nice to see that uh, they're acknowledging that they, they, they're they going to have to do better because the demand is way higher than they anticipated for something like this. When you tout out, hey, we had 10 million subscribers day one, those are huge numbers. But, you know, if they have a massive drop off by the time they have their next quarterly results, that's not going to be a, a real great thing for them, especially for their stock and things like that. So they've got to they got to keep those subscribers. And if anything, they've got to keep them and grow that number because it's not going to be a good good thing for them if by the time they release their quarterly earnings, they're lower or and it's just like well everybody signed up initially but then they realized that there wasn't as much content so i'm glad that they've acknowledged that there's issues with tech hopefully they'll acknowledge that there's issues with content very here very near in the future it was actually amusing because last week when we were talking about the issues with the content literally the next day they went and posted hey there's another series coming on in december which was called pick of the litter and there was a it's not again not a not a show that I'm going to be interested in watching, but it at least acknowledges the fact that they have more content that is that exists that they haven't talked about because that's a that's a show that wasn't even on the radar of shows that had already been announced that were coming. So there is a potential that they have something else to replace, you know, to take the slot that Mandalorian has, not necessarily as as a marquee, but something that is definitely going to you know. So it's not just there. There's another one less show that's releasing. They'll have something else. They just haven't revealed exactly what it's going to be at this point. So uh, that's nice to see as well. With that being said, that is going to wrap it up for this shorter episode discussing the uh, two interview or discuss, discussing basically uh, Kevin Meyer from Disney Plus and John Stanky from HBO Max talking to Recode at the Recode event this past or that last last week. So uh, we hope you enjoyed this shorter form. We're probably going to have some more of these. We do have another one that we'll be releasing uh, this week as well, uh, but we're going to leave that topic up in the air, but you can expect that as well in the very near future. So with all of that being said, be sure to follow us on Twitter and our and join our discord for all the latest articles that we're talking about on the podcast um, you can also follow us on instagram for all the latest announcements related to when the new episodes post for the podcast you can send us an email at the streaming wars at gmail.com and if you are so inclined we'd appreciate a five-star review on any podcast platform that you're currently listening to us on with all that being said for tony and myself you've been listening to the streaming wars and we'll see you guys next time thanks for listening to the streaming wars Check us out on Twitter and Instagram. Also consider supporting us on Patreon. Links can be found at thestreaminwars.io.